So the devotees invited me for one of these darshans. And uh, I, at one of the darshans, I asked Prabhupada. It was a, a Gargamuni had um, requested Prabhupada to sing the Chintamani prayers, which Prabhupada had done very beautifully. And uh, asked afterwards, he asked if anyone had any questions, so I raised my hand. And at the time, I was, um, I was, um, the draft board was, you know, a problem for every one of us at that age. So I was very concerned about whether or not I'd be drafted because America was at war with, in Vietnam. And so I asked Prabhupada um, to describe what the spiritual world was like. And he said to me, uh, he looked back and he looked at me and he said, in the spiritual world, he said, the spiritual world is a place where there are no draft boards. <laughs> then he told the story. He said, there was once a uh, Christian minister who was preaching in England to coal miners. And uh, he was describing the hell that awaited someone if they didn't accept the shelter of Jesus. And uh, he said that uh, hell is a terrible place, very, very dark, very dank and cold and wet. He said, no one would want to go there. So all the coal miners were thinking, well, if that's hell, you know, where are we? We're already in hell. It doesn't sound very f fearful for us. This is where we live now. We're coal miners. So then the minister was trying to think of a way to convince them to take, to begin worshiping Jesus. So then finally he said, in, in uh, hell, there are no newspapers, and there's no tea. And then they all said, oh, then we must worship Jesus. So Prabhupada said, so in the spiritual world, there are no draft boards. He said, is that all right? <laughs> and I said, yes. Everybody said, jai. One morning, I shaved my head. And when I came, Prabhupada, the first time he saw me, he came out of his uh, apartment. And he looked at me, and he saw my head shaved. And he said, ah, now you are an ideal brahmachari. He was very pleased that I had shaved my head because he had noticed all along that I was keeping short hair, but I wouldn't shave up. So, and uh, I had joined with Vishnu Jan, and he had shaved up before me, but I didn't shave up immediately. So when I finally shaved up, Prabhupada appreciated that. One time I asked Prabhupada on one of those morning walks, first walks I went with him, I asked him how many pure devotees were there on the planet. And Srila Prabhupada turned to me or to one of the devotees and asked, how many devotees are there in ISKCON now? He said, that is how many pure devotees there are. The first letter I wrote to Prabhupada was all about Sankirtan. I told him what the results of Sankirtan were. See, what happened was that Prabhupada told us, all the brahmacharis, to get jobs. Because Jayananda was supporting the temple single-handedly, Prabhupada said it wasn't fair. So he said, all the brahmacharis should go out and get jobs. So, you know, everybody did what they knew best. I remember Vishnu John, he decided that he was going to make flutes, bamboo flutes, and he used to stand on Haight Street, and he made all the flutes so that they played Hare Krishna. And he would just stand out on Haight Street playing Hare Krishna all day. And he said oh, he was a Brahmin. And he told me that I, would, I was a Sudra because I went to work for Kodak. See, Gurudas was working at Kodak, so Gurudas got me a job at Kodak, and it was a very, you know, one of these uh, high-tech high -tech jobs. I would get the uh, film canister and break it in half. That was my job. <laughs> break the film canister, put it, break the film canister. And then when they saw that I was really capable of doing that, they moved me up to a higher position where I would run the uh, film through a heating elements and it would be developed this way. And then I would get to bring it to Gurudas, who was in the dark room developing. He got a bigger salary than I did. So you can imagine what this was like. But still, it was yoga, and I felt it was yoga. I'd give the whole check to the temple, and every day I just you know, looked forward to the lunch break. I'd immediately go out and have my little lunch, and uh, I'd go out and with Gurudas and take lunch, and we'd have some kartals and do some kirtan. And it was the only thing that saved me was that lunch break. But after a month or two of this, it was unbearable. Gargamuni went to... Uh, to Mon Montreal and talked to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said that if they don't want to do this, then let them go out on the street and do chant on the streets. 
So we had an Ista Ghosti, and uh, we discussed this, and I volunteered that I would organize it because I wanted to get out of that job. So <laughs> I was very eager to, or I was ready to do anything to get out of that job. So we did about $12 the first day, and I thought this is, and I went back to the temple. Gargamuni had a little shop. And I said, Gargamuni, we did $12. He said, wow. He said, I'm going to give up my shop. This is big. This has huge potential. <laughs> he was ready to give up his shop. So uh, the next day, I decided to take Back to Godhead's with us. And when the people give a donation, I give them a Back to Godhead. And the collections, by the end of five days, it had gone up to $40. And I wrote Prabhupada day by day how it increased. And Prabhupada wrote me this letter. And he said, don't worry so much about money. He said, if Krishna wants, he can give you the whole USA. The question is, what will you do with it? Do you know what to do with it? So it was a sobering letter. Prabhupada was very pleased with this Harinam party. He decided when he left San Francisco to open a temple in Seattle, Gargamuni and Upendra had gone there, and Prabhupada decided that the Sankirtan party should go with him. And at that point, Jayananda went to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, well, again, it was Swamiji at the time, he said, Swamiji, you know, I'd like to travel with the Sankirtan party. And Prabhupada said, but you are the president. And he said, I think this is more important. And then uh, Prabhupada said, well, what will you do? And he said, I'll be the driver. And Prabhupada thought for a second, said, very good, you can go. And he was willing to, he thought so much about Sankirtan that he was willing to let the top devotee, the person who was maintaining the whole temple, who was the temple president, he was prepared to let him go to become the driver of the Sankirtan party. So Jayana had to join our party that way. When the operation was going on, they gave this anesthetic, you know, they put the, they anesthetize you. And I remember I was meditating on Radha Ras Bihari and the Arti. And I was just meditating on it, and they said, count down from 10 down. And I, I think I got down to about seven, and that was it. And then I had a dream, a very good dream in which uh, Srila Prabhupada had been called by the previous acharyas to make a report of his preaching mission on this planet. And the previous acharyas were all there. And they asked Prabhupada that, uh, you know, what is your report? And Prabhupada said that um, he had studied the people of this planet and he had found that they had no capacity for taking any type of austerity nor were they very capable of studying, um, and they were not very pious. He said, the only thing that so far they seem to be able to do is that somehow they take shelter at my feet. This was the dream I had. And then they wheeled me out after the operation, and when I came in to the room which had been assigned to me, Prabhupada was sitting there. Actually, he had come to the hospital, and he said, I came here as fast as I could, I, would try. I wanted to stop the operation. He said, because I think you should have had this operation in America. But anyway, now it is there. And it turned out he had come all the way in from Juhu in a jeep, right in the middle of the rush hour, to try to stop this operation. So I told Prabhupada about the dream. And Prabhupada listened very intently. And he said, hmm. he said, actually, this is so. He said, this is so. So when Prabhupada came to San Francisco, he had wanted me to come back to India to take up my service again because he couldn't find anyone to replace me as a GBC. And so when Prabhupada was there, as soon as we got in the car, we picked him up. Prabhupada started talking about Hare Krishna land and India. And I was just, I could feel the pressure was coming down. So then we went into Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada had, you know, it was just myself and Prabhupada in the room. And he said, so? You know, uh, what are you going to do? Are you prepared to come back to India? And I said, well, Prabhupada, I'm preaching now. And Prabhupada was a little upset. He said, what is that preaching? He said, preaching means there must be results. I said, though, there's results. He says, what are those results? Let me see really what are the results. So I had had all of our new men shave up. And they all were completely fresh shaved, the 10 new bhaktas. And I had them each come up with a rose. And one by one, they came up and they put a rose on Prabhupada's desk. And they offered their obeisances, dandavats. And then they sat down, and Prabhupada started to beam. And he said, this is preaching. He was so happy to see this. He said, so you stay here. He approved of it. We came through. The next program that Prabhupada was going to was in Madras. 
and we stopped, the train stopped from Ahmedabad to Madras, stopped in Bombay, but because my wife was now at the temple and I was a sannyasi, I wouldn't go. So I sent my party to see Prabhupada and give the report, and I just sat in the train station waiting for them to come. It was a six-hour or something wait over. And then suddenly Yadubara came, and he said, Prabhupada sent me here to bring you back. He said, you can come to the temple. I said, but you know, my wife is there, former wife is there, I can't go, I'm a sonia. I said, Pra no, Prabhupada said, it's okay. So as soon as I came into the room and I offered my obeisance, Prabhupada said, the temple is a neutral ground. He said, it is neutral. You can be here at the same time, there's no harm. And then he asked everyone to leave the room, which was quite unusual, I thought. Because Prabhupada didn't generally do that. He asked everyone to leave the room and he beckoned me over to the table and he said, now tell me, give me your report. So I gave him the report and he was so happy about this preaching report because I had just been a sannyasi the first, this was his first preaching assignment he'd given me. And after it, he became so pleased, he stood up and I had offered my obeisances and he stood up, so I stood up and he walked around the table and he just took me in his arms and he held me very tightly, he embraced me on one side and then he embraced me on the other side and he said, now take this sannyas mantra in your heart and go everywhere and preach. He said, now, he said, Kirtananda is a sannyasi, Brahmananda is a sannyasi, and you're a sannyasi. Now I can retire peacefully and translate. Go and preach. And I was just, my whole body was so transformed, you know, I felt by Prabhupada's touch because it was very rare that Prabhupada would use his body so much like that to, and it was a real, you know, I really felt surcharged by that, empowered by that. And uh, then I went back to the train and we went to Madras. It was about July, I believe, Ju July of uh, 70, and I was in Paris. Prabhupada had sent me to Europe uh, to organize our temples in London and Paris and uh, Hamburg. At that time, there was no GBC, but uh, he put me in charge to coordinate the temples there. So I was in Paris, and I suddenly got a telegram. Your letter, 26th July. Come Los Angeles immediately. I was on a plane that same day. And I just detached myself and I got on a plane and went to Los Angeles. So that was uh, quite a time because it was the time of, you, you know, our four sannyasis in our society had, there was some uh, difficulty in their understanding of how uh, the movement was to be run. So Prabhupada was very, very disturbed because he had detected that there had been some poison which had come in terms of belittling his position, which had come from some of his godbrothers in India. So I came in the evening, and then the next morning Prabhupada called me, having heard I had come, and he called me, and he was very grave. And he looked very shriveled almost. And he looked up to me, and all, he, he just had a little spotlight on, on his table, desk lamp. He looked up and he said, have they told you? And I said, yes, Prabhupada. He said, can you take me out of here? I said, yes, Prabhupada. He said, where will you take me? So I thought and I said, well, I could take you to Florida. I said, it's not far enough. I said, I could take you to Europe. He said, the poison has spread there as well. And I said, then where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to India. I think that Prabhupada had the ability to accomplish many, many purposes by each one of his actions. Later on, Prabhupada told me in 1977, he said, uh, we were, Prabhupada was laying in his bed in Krishna Balaram temple, and uh, we were reminiscing. He said, remember when you took me? from Los Angeles. I said, yes. He said, at that time, he said, I went before Sri Sri Rukmini Dwarkadish, and I said, my dear Lord, you have called me all the way here, and you have given me this wonderful temple. Now why are you sending me away? Prabhupada said, I couldn't understand why the Lord was sending me out. And he said, now I understand. 
because he wanted to give me this temple, Krishna Balaram temple. He said, this is 100 times what every other temple in the world is. He said, but I didn't understand at that time. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's, uh, I think it was appearance day. So I told Prabhupada that Srila Prabhupada, you know, can we celebrate this in the evening? Because then we'll have a lot of guests. Prabhupada said, no. It must be celebrated at noon. So it was on a Friday. I said, Friday evening, we can fill up the temple. He said, no, it must be at noon. So we celebrated in the room, in Prabhupada's room. We, Prabhupada had a little room. This is the La Sienica Boulevard Temple, L.A. Prabhupada had a side room next to the big temple room. So uh, Prabhupada did all of the prayers and spoke about his Guru Maharaj. Then he said to me, how is the feast going? So I said, I'll take a look. It was about 10.30. So I went in. Nothing was done. There was no preparation. So I went back to and I said, you know, what is going on here? I started screaming at them. They said, well, you told us it was going to be Friday night. And I said, Prabhupada wanted it at noon. You know, maybe it was my mistake. I might not have conveyed the message in any case. So I went back to Prabhupada and he said, so, how is it going? And I said, uh, there's nothing done. You know, Prabhupada just looked at me, didn't say a word, got up, walked through, out of his room, through the temple, through the prasanam hall, and into the kitchen. He immediately got, told the devotees, get this done, get this done, cut this vegetable, with this. He cooked a feast in one hour for at least 70 devotees personally cooked the whole feast, at least 12 preparations, within one hour's time. And he always told me, I always remember this, Prabhupada always said, deity worship is one hour's business, cooking is one hour's business. Cooked the whole feast in one hour. And I remember one of the best things I remember about it was the way Prabhupada made the puris that day. Because every puri puffed up. He put in the puri in the hot ghee, you know, and he would just touch it. And it was like he would touch them. I remember they would blow a little and he would touch them, even sometimes with his finger. And it just, psh, perfect puris. Then the feast was offered and it was brought out of Prabhupada's room after. It was given to Prabhupada, the whole maha plate. Within about three minutes afterwards, it came out practically untouched. And we were all eating this big feast and we saw Prabhupada didn't eat and everybody, you know, Prabhupada was very upset. But he still cooked the whole feast for his Guru Maharaj. He was determined that it must be, and he told him it must be offered by 12. But he was very disturbed. The first meeting we had with the whole group of members of Dainapan, the top chairman down, they all came and very formally they presented their cards to Prabhupada. I, I think this story is told in, in the Lilamrita. They all presented their cards and then they left, and Prabhupada was left with one, you know, the number seven man to just show us off at the end. It was like a whole ceremony, it was like a tea ceremony, but we drank water. They drank tea. They were on one side of the big, big oak desk and we were on the other. So Prabhupada had a word f with the man before we went to the limousine and he asked the man, what is, you know, your goal? And of course he had, Prabhupada had been given these calling cards by each of them. My name is so-and-so, my name is so-and-so. So that, that man took all the cards and put them in a in a row, up from down, and he was number seven. When Prabhupada asked him what his goal in life was, he took the card, number seven, and he went like this. And Prabhupada shook his head and laughed, and then he really, you know, started to preach this man about the nature of life and how temporary it was, and that was not the purpose of life. So uh, Prabhupada was a real transcendental negotiator. He had me be the heavy man. And Dinapan would give a price, and I would say it's impossible, and I'd give this ridiculously low price, and they would just practically start crying. It was so ridiculous, the price. And that we would get into a big argument, and Prabhupada would just sit there in a neutral position, and finally he would act as if he was the arbitrator. And he'd say, this is not good, this should not be quarreling like this. He said, I will settle it. He said, you know, neither side should argue like this. We must consider both the needs of each side. And he would pick the price that he wanted you know, which was still extremely low, but by that time they would just think that, you know, Prabhupada was their savior. 
And this way, we went through all of the prices of each book, and Prabhupada uh, got a very low contract prices. And he was very proud that he had been able to get $60,000 worth of business with a $5,000 down payment. He said, I have so much, they have so much trust and faith in my writing. In London, of course, that was another interesting negotiation. Uh, Prabhupada told us, I got to London in, 19, in, 19, uh, in September of 1969, and uh, by that time Prabhupada was getting ready to get the place in Bari Place, Seven Bari Place. And what is a temple without deities? So Prabhupada gave us the instruction that we need to, you have to install Radhakrishna deities. But he didn't order the deities, and we didn't have any deities. He just said, the such and such December so and so was the date of the opening, and you have to have Radhakrishna Didi. So we, you know, started to go. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. How are you supposed to find Radha and Krishna in London? We just started to ask anyone and everyone. It was like a, you know, a national alarm. Anyone knowing the whereabouts of Radha and Krishna, please phone such and such number. And that was the number of Mukunda's wife, Janaki. So. Well, it went, you know, week after week went by, and Prabhupada would call us and say, where are the deities? And we said, you know, we don't know where Radha and Krishna are. Prabhupada said, you have to have deities. So finally, miraculously, when we were practically giving up, we get this phone call. Janaki gets a phone call. Someone says, we have Radha Krishna deities. So immediately she informed Mukunda, and Mukunda and I went down to this man's house. And the man took us to his study, and he said, I have some Radhakrishna marble deities. Would you like to look at them? So, you know, would we like to look at them? You know, we were ready to jump out of our skins, practically. Sure, we wanted to look at them. And he took off the cloth, and, you know, we just uh, offered our obeisances, because that was Radhalanda and Ishvara. So uh, we said, they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. I mean, they were beautiful. And he said, well, I'm considering that I may be willing to give them to your temple. So we said, well, we have to, you know, can we bring our spiritual master to see them? And he said, yes, you can do so. So we raced out, and we went to a phone booth. I remember we called immediately to Prabhupada's apartment. Prabhupada was living near Regent's Park, a very nice apartment. And um, we called up, and he was resting, so we decided just to go over there. We went in, and we told him, Prabhupada, we found Radha and Krishna. So Prabhupada Amina said, take me, I want to see them. So we had a van, we used to have a van. And uh, it was Prabhupada and Mukunda, Shamsundar, and myself, maybe Gurudas, came in the van and we went in. And by that time was the early evening, Prabhupada came in and he started to talk with this Indian gentleman, very friendly way. The man said that these deities were ordered already for society, but somehow or other things had not worked out. There was some difficulty, and they could not use the deity. So Prabhupada would just ignore the point, and he just kept asking the man, where are you from? How are you? How's your wife? He made the man bring his wife in, bring the children in. Prabhupada, you know, gave his blessings to everyone, just talking, talking. And finally the man, you know, said, Swamiji, don't you want to see the deities? And Prabhupada said, oh, yeah, yes, we can see the deities. It was just so nonchalant, as if he was not even interested. So, uh, you know, he said, please, I want to show them to you. you know. So he took the man, the man took Prabhupada over, and um, he showed him the deities. And Prabhupada looked and said, hmm. And he just turned around and walked and sat back in the sofa. So the man said, um, so Swamiji, I mean, what do you think? Can you use the deity? Prabhupada said, yeah, they, they look like they may be used. He said, well, uh, you know, I'm thinking I can give them to you. Prabhupada said, yes, we could, we could accept them. And uh, he said, uh, he asked me, go and see how heavy the deity is. So I went over and Shamsunda went over and uh, I tilted Radharani, and I said, not very heavy. And she was heavy, but I said, not very heavy. Shamsana had Krishna. Prabhupada said, uh, all right, 
we'll take them now. He said, pick them up, and we just, and then the man said, wait, wait, Swamiji, wait a moment. I think maybe he had an idea of recovering some of the cost. I don't know what he had an idea. He said, wait, wait. And he said, no, 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 there's no problem. It's not heavy. These are American boys. They're very strong. And we carried the deities out, and uh, the man was just protesting, Swamiji, Swamiji, went one minute, and we walked right out to the van and brought Radha Krishna, put them in, and Prabhupada sat down in the seat next to the driver's seat. And uh, he said, you know, I'll take care of the deities. We'll be in touch with you. And uh, the man just, you know, the whole family was out there, and they were just like this. And Prabhupada said, okay, let's drive. So we drove off, and when we got around the corner, Prabhupada said, stop the car. And then uh, we stopped the van, and Prabhupada said, take the cloth off the deities. We took the deities, and Prabhupada just started to offer prayers. There were tears in his eyes, and he started to sing the prayers from Brahma Samhita. And he said, Krishna has now appeared in London. Pishima was adored and even worshipped, by, especially by the lady devotees. One time we were going in procession from Calcutta to Mayapur, and Pishima was in one of the rear cars. And uh, then she got out, and all the women rushed there, and they were doing, and Prabhupada said, what are they doing? I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, they, you know, they're, they have respect for her, you know, as they do, in a way, for you. He said, why? What is that? What has she ever done? She's just an old lady. What has she ever done? <laughs> I had a habit, whenever Prabhupada would tell me something, I would always say, just unconsciously, I know, I know, I know. And one day Prabhupada said, you know, you know. You think you know everything. Very, and I really, you know. It's like that. You think you know everything. Another time, Prabhupada had this system when he did his construction projects in India. Two signers on every check. Prabhupada was one signer and I was the other. There was only one problem when Prabhupada would travel out of the country. So one day I suggested to Prabhupada, why don't you sign some blank checks? <laughs> Prabhupada did not like that idea at all. He said, this, he said, this is my account. Is it all right that I decide how the money will be used? Is that all right with you? Whew. You know, I was suggesting to him that we could do different things. <laughs> Prabhupada had a system of keys you know, for keeping his, he would, you see, Prabhupada would keep a key under his keychain, under his wristwatch. This was the key to whatever, wherever his belongings were kept, his valuables were kept. So, he'd never part with this key. But because thing, he was becoming very ill, you know, I was always, you know, desiring that Prabhupada would take me into his confidence. So one day he really gave me an ultimate confidence in letting me hold the key. This was a key to his desk drawer. So uh, I had the key, and then, you know, naturally, what would I do but lose the key? So I came before Prabhupada. Prabhupada asked for something. I, I didn't tell him right away. I mean, I scoured Hare Krishna land. I went everywhere looking for that key, and I could not find it. I had people looking all over that place. And finally, Prabhupada called for something from the desk, and I went to Prabhupada, and I said, uh, Srila Prabhupada, I have to tell you something. Prabhupada was laying down because he was ill. I said, yes. I said, Prabhupada, I lost the key. Prabhupada said, call the GBC. I said, which one, Prabhupada? He said, call the whole GBC here to decide what should be done. And I went, oh, God. He said, call the whole GBC. So I just, there was nothing I could do. I just walked out and I decided, okay, I'm going to call the GBC here. He wanted to call the whole GBC body to Bombay to decide what was going to be done with me, I guess. I don't know what the... So then I got this, you know, I was just beside myself, and suddenly I thought, let me try another key. And, you know, sure enough, it was an Indian lock. <laughs> I just got another key, and somehow or other, I opened it up. And I ran to Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, 
I said, uh, I, 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 said uh, I opened it. I opened it. He said, how did you open it? I said, I found another key. And he thought, and he said, that means the lock was not very good. He said, then it doesn't matter if you lost that key because it's not a good lock. So then he said, you know, now put the key on your Brahmin thread. He made me put the key on my thread, put the thread through it and put the key. And he said, don't ever lose this. But he had a very interesting way of keeping the key. This key was a key that opened up a safe. The safe had a key that opened up his Almira. And in the Almira, in, under a special place was the key that opened up the safe in the Almira. Four keys. He had a whole key system. One key led to another key that led to another key that finally led to the key that opened up the safe. The prophet had a lot of systems. Another thing he had me do is that every, every key had to be labeled and there had to be a, a, a log of all the keys, an index of all the keys. And not only was there an index of every key, there was an index of every item in every Almira. He wanted everything systematized. This was an Indian system. Just like you go to India, every seat, every desk, you know, is gazetted, is numbered. That's the go Indian government. Prabhupada did certain things, like Prabhupada told me, we must, you have to keep all documents for seven years. He had many things he learned from the Indian government. He always used to quote about the Indian railways, you know, that said, keep the wheels moving. He said that was a good motto for ISKCON, keep the wheels moving. Prabhupada was in the early days. I was the, the Mott commander in Los Angeles, La Sienica Temple. Prabhupada called me one day. And he was uh, talking to me and he, he asked me to get the Bhagavatam. He had the Bhagavatam, his original Bhagavatam. And he said the cover, you know, was a spiritual sky. And he said, you see this spiritual sky? It's very big. He said, you cannot fathom how big this is. He said, in this, the spiritual sky, one f three quarters of the spiritual sky, one quarter is the material creation. That material creation has innumerable universes. You know, one universe is so big the scientists can't measure it. And we're on one planet in one of those universes out of innumerable universes, which are constituting one quarter of the creation. So on this one planet, Earth, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the smaller planets in this universe. He said there are seven continents, and on one of the continents, North America, there is a great city called Los Angeles. And in that Los Angeles city, there's a long boulevard called La Cienica. And on that La Cienica boulevard, there is one church building, which is now a Hare Krishna temple. And in that one Hare Krishna temple, there is one temple commander, and he thinks that he is very important. And I was, you know, <laughs> I felt so small. Prabhupada said, he thinks that he is very important. There is one Tamal Krishna, and he thinks that he is very important. I don't remember what it was that I did, but there was some foolish thing I did. And Prabhupada looked at me, you know. It was something about, the, I had forgotten something. And so I, I said, Prabhupada, I just can't remember. He said, yes, you cannot remember. He said, because there is nothing inside there to be able to remember with. He said, simply zero, just zero. Whew. I thought, this is the final thing after all these years. There's nothing in there, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, boy. <laughs> Heavy chastisement. I when we got to Rishikesh, Prabhupada was ill. And uh, we were staying in this house, Ganga Darshan, very nice house, right overlooking the Ganga. Prabhupada had been lured there by uh, Nava Yogendra Swami, who told him, if you drink water, uh, I think it was he who lured, if you drink water there, you'll get back your health. So as soon as we got there, Prabhupada told me, bring Ganga Jal. And I immediately put on my gumption, I dove off the second story of the building, because it was overlooking the Ganga, and I dove into the Ganga from the second floor, Prabhupada was getting his massage, and I went out with a loda and came back, swam back with the loda, brought up, and Prabhupada, right in the middle of the, you know, and he was not eating well at those time, this time, it was the last month, he immediately took a full, you know, glass of water, and a big belch came out afterwards, and Prabhupada said, ah, accepted. 
and he smiled and he was very pleased with that. I was standing there dripping wet and he accepted. So then he immediately ordered, go out and get kachoris, kachoris and jalebis. There was one shop very famous for making jalebis and kachoris in Rishikesh. And Prabhupada said, this hot jalebis is a remedy, cure, for a uh, sore throat. He said, now it is a little cold, we must get hot jalebis. So we ate hot jalebis, and he said, this is, whenever you have sore throat, you eat hot jalebis. But it must be made fresh hot. And another time, Prabhupada gave me the r cure for, it was a very nice cure, isn't it? Jalebis, if they're made you know, nicely, are so tasty, and that's how you get better. Another cure he gave me was when you have dysentery. Hot puris and salt. The puris must be cooked in ghee. They must be right off the fire with salt. And sure enough, I had this dysentery. I took hot puris and salt, immediately cured, like a cork. His son was there, Vrindavan Chandra. And Vrindavan Chandra and myself were with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada started to remember his grihasta life. And then he started to say, he said, actually, he said, my wife was your mother. He said, your mother, he was telling his son, your mother was very good, very chaste, very devoted. He said, one could not ask for a better wife. He said, it was I. He said, I was not very easy. And he started to cry. He said, she was so good. And it was like he exhibited all of these apparently human qualities. And as a sannyasi, and he said, I should not say this. He said, I should not say it. But I could see it was just a way of healing any possible feeling which that his son might have had towards him for having left the family and taken sannyas. And it wasn't acting, but he just, he was very soft. His heart was so soft. I liked moments like this where, you know, there were very extraordinary moments where you'd, it's so different than what normally Prabhupada showed in his official position. But they were so special and charming. A back book distribution, Prabhupada said, big books are more important than soft backs. He said, hard back is more important than soft back. He was very firm about this point. Give out big books. He wanted more big books distributed. He always said that. And he really liked the Radha Dominant Party. He said, the main thing he liked about the Radha Dominant Party, he said, you have understood a very important point, that in the Kali Yuga, people don't come to the temple. You have to bring the temple to the people that this was the whole idea about book distribution. Go out to the people. Prabhupada said very clearly that any way that they could come into contact with these books, he said even they just touch it, he said even if they look at a picture, if they touch the book, he said they, be they begin their devotional life. Therefore, he told the book distributors, put the book in their hands. He said if they just touch the book, never mind even read, if they touch the book, it has so much power. One time Prabhupada would tell me, another thing he didn't like is that I would fall asleep sometimes. As soon as I get in the car, I fall asleep. So we were riding in the car, in the back seat, I was sitting next to Prabhupada. And I, you know, I was just like this. So Prabhupada said, you are sleeping. So I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. He said, you were sleeping. I said, I don't think I was sleeping. He said, I said you were sleeping, you were sleeping. He said, chant Hare Krishna. So I started to chant, and I, you know, Prabhupada was chanting Japa very quietly, and I was going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Hare. And then I, you know, when you, you know how you catch yourself when you stop? And I looked at Prabhupada, Prabhupada just like, chanting. <laughs> Another time, Upendra was sleeping in the front seat, and he was going like this. So Prabhupada leaned over, and he very gently caught Upendra's sika from behind. So when a pender went like this, the seeker yanked. <laughs> and Pendra turned around. He thought I had done it. He was very angry, you know. But it was <laughs> Prabhupada had caught a seeker. So Prabhupada had a very big appetite. He used to, he really relished prashanam. And he would take at least 45, 50 minutes to take prashanam. And he would eat alone. And he would chew and chew with his eyes closed. Chewing, chewing, chewing. And just really relishing prasad. When we went to India, of course, we got to eat with Prabhupada regularly because we would be invited. Prabhupada said, this is preaching. He said, we, he said, we make members by eating. He said, very good preaching. Because in Surat, when we went to Surat in Gujarat, 
he made a condition that he would only take prasadam if the person would become the life member. So we got 30 days invitation. He made 30 members. He said, this is preaching. And all the devotees would sit together. Prabhupada would be at the head on their little chonkies, and we would all sit and take prasad. So it was very nice. We got trained to take prasadam with Prabhupada. Uh, Prabhupada was in a room in London, Pari Place, and he was appreciating the, the service of Jamuna Devi. Prabhupada said, I mean, Prabhupada glorified Jamuna Devi unlimitedly for her qualities and her devotion. Very, he, he once wrote her a letter that she was on the level of Baba Bhakti. In a letter he wrote this very high position. And, uh, but one day he said to me, he said, if she weren't a woman, I would make her a GBC. If she weren't a woman, I would make her a GBC. Someone brought uh, ice cream from New Vrindavan to Prabhupada in, Vrind in Vrindavan, the final days. And Prabhupada took it right on a teaspoon and ate ice cream from New Vrindavan. They somehow they had dry ice, they kept it cold. And they brought him a ring they had made. And as soon as we showed Prabhupada the ring, he said, so, where is the bride? I said, where is the bride? Jai Anilo, 